So I'm gonna talk about where do animals live? And then I'll show you some images of skeletons and animals and that. And then at the very end, I have a bunch of skeletons that I have here in my lab. And I'm gonna show them to you and I'm going, you, I'm going to ask you a question based on their skeleton. And hopefully I will taught you so well that you will be able to answer all of my questions. I think we, you'll be able to do this. Okay. Cool. So one thing I want to mention real quick is that I am recording this, students. So I think you probably just got the notification that I'm recording. And that is show, uh, so I can show this to my fourth and sixth period. Uh, I'm not going to put it online or anything. So if you're worried about having your image online, it's, it's not going to be put up like that. Um, it's just going to be shown, and Miss Maddox is going to um, show it to her class on on Friday. All right, so um, I guess we're ready to go. Does anyone have any questions before we proceed? All right, cool. Be an exam, by the way. <laughs> All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back millions of years, and I'm going to show you some general images of uh, what the limbs of animals back then looked like. And I'll give you an idea how we know this, but I'm gonna start at the bottom. And if you can't see this in great detail, don't worry about it. I'll just kind of describe this. But in the limbs of some of our ancient animals, what we found are what we call little islands of bones. And we can start to see a pattern of those bones that gives us an idea as to how they're going to evolve. And so we have an arrow coming up here, to what we see in kind of this organization. And when we look at this, we get an idea of what's happening. We can start to see that in these bones, there's going to be a change in shape, a change in organization. But then when you look at this, you can tell that this is what current animals, contemporary animals look like if you looked at their bones. And then we go and we can see this pattern now. And this is really the organization that we see in animals. It doesn't matter if it's human or a cat or a bird or whatever, I'm gonna show you this. We can just take this pattern and say, look, this could be an upper limb. This could be an arm, a forearm, a wrist and fingers, or it could be the hind limb where we can see the thigh and the leg and the ankle and the toes. And this pattern holds true for all of the animals. And when I said I study vertebrates, this is what we see. And we attach the limb to the body, the vertebral column, and this is what we have. And so how did we know that this is what the animals were doing? We simply look at the fossil record. And the fossils show us that we can see this this happens to be an aquatic animal, but we can see a shoulder blade, a scapula, a humerus, a radius, an ulna, a wrist bone, and then the bones for the hand, for that, in this case, a foot. All right? So we saw this, and we looked at all the fossils we had, and we said, look, this is the transition that's occurring. Okay? So most of the animals that I'm going to talk about and most of the animals that you see are animals that live on land. Now I will talk about some animals that live in water, but most of the animals that we talk about live on land. And so what is the body organization that we see? And that is this. We can see this is a nice picture of a Great Dane. And we say that this organism, because it walks around on four limbs, is a quadruped. And we say that it is quadrupedal. Okay? Quad means four, four limbs. And we can just look at that repeating pattern that I talked about. Humerus, radius ulna, wrist. Toes. Doesn't matter if it's human or dog, we, we can still see this pattern. In now, we are not quadrupeds, okay? We walk on two limbs, our lower limbs. Although I know some newborns look like quadrupeds. In fact, if you want to think about it, they actually look like alligators. So if you ever watch a newborn learn to crawl, you just watch that body pattern and you think, you know what? We used to be a quadruped. 
And that's how we got around. But then we didn't like that. We wanted to get up on two limbs. And so we started climbing on the couch and tables and everything. And we learned to walk with two limbs. Now, I don't want you to get kind of boxed in and think, all right, we're the only bipeds because some of our contemporaries do get up on their hind limbs sometime. And this is just a picture of a chimpanzee. And if you've ever seen videos of chimpanzees, you think, hey, they do get up on their hind limbs. They don't look real good doing this because that's not their normal form of locomotion. They really are quadrupeds and they move around on all fours most of the time. So we've got quadrupeds and we've got bipeds. So I want you to be careful because I want you to see how you would categorize this organism. Moving around on two limbs, okay? And this is an emu. I just was thinking about limu emu, the commercial that's all over the place. But this is a biped, okay? It has wings, it doesn't fly, and it moves around by these two hind limbs. And so here is a bipedal organism that's very fast, very agile on the, on the ground, but it's not what we would call a quadruped. So don't think that humans are the only bipeds. We like to think that we're advanced and all that and that we've learned how to stand on two limbs, but that's not true with all animals, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk about different environments. What kind of an environment does an animal live on? And I'm gonna start with terrestrial, okay? And when I teach with my students, I like to tell them the etymology. The etymology means the history or the reason for the word, okay? So like quad means four and bi means two. Terrestrial comes from a Latin word, and that Latin word is terra, and it means land. So I'm going to talk about the animals that move around on the land, okay? Whatever that is, if it's grass or dirt or what have you, that, that doesn't matter. And this is a terrestrial animal. This is an elephant. But I'm gonna show us that terrestrial animals move around on land in different ways. Elephants do it one way, and I'll show you what their skeleton looks like. And then I'll show you a cheetah and some of these other animals, but their body design is matched to how they get around, okay? So when we look at the skeleton of an elephant, I want you to notice that the bones of the limbs look like they're just right on top of each other. And I want you to think about something like a, a building that's made out of stone and they build blocks that they put on top of each other. Whether it's a column, say at the state, the uh, Capitol in Washington, DC, it doesn't matter. We put these bones on top of each other so that the gravity, the weight of the animal goes right through those bones. And because of that, we say these animals are gravitatorial. And they let the bones bear the weight because of how they're oriented, one on top of each other. And if you've ever watched an elephant walk, its limbs basically stay in line, okay? And that way they can bear the weight of this very heavy body. And if you've ever seen them run, they can move pretty quickly, but they keep their limbs the same way, okay? So if we look at a diagram, this is a forelimb of an elephant. You can see they are all right aligned with each other. And then, then we get down to what this is, is the, the front paw, if you want to call that, of the elephant. But even these bones are stacked up on top of each other until we get down to what is the equivalent of their fingers. And then their fingers kind of splay out, and then they have a real soft pad right below them but they're putting all the forces right in line, okay? So that's a terrestrial animal. And that is an adaptation to move around, but to be big. 
And so being big sometimes has an advantage, okay? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about some different ways to move around on land. And I'm gonna show you some diagrams of bones for different animals. And then we'll see if we can sort this out with some of the bones we'll see at the end. All right. So same body plan, no different. This happens to be the hind limb of animals. But in this case, we can see one, a bear, and we say that a bear is plantigrade. And what that means is that the bear lands on the bottom of its rear paw, which is a foot to us. So the whole set of bones that makes up that limb lands on the ground, okay? And that would be true for the forepaw in the front and the hind paw here that we see, okay? Keep that in mind, because I'm gonna ask you this about some bones that I have, and we'll see if we can figure that out. The next diagram we have is of a dog. And this animal, as we can see in this diagram here, is the progenitor. And that name tells us that the dog, the cat, they move when they're running around on their toes, but also in what we call, in this case, the metatarsals. I'll give you that name because that's the set of bones that they're walking on. Parcels are the ankle bones. Look how long they are. And I'll show you why everybody thinks the dog has a backward knee. But that actually is the ankle bone and the knee joints way up by the body. So it's not really easy to see this. So we come down onto these metatarsals and parcels here. And that means that's what this animal walks around on the ground. And then the third animal is a deer. And we say that this is an ungulograde. And believe it or not, what it walks on are the equivalent of its toenails. Okay, so they're at the very end of the digits, if, if you want to say the toes of this animal, and then the material that's equivalent to what our fingernails or toenails are. That's what they walk on. And then I'm going to show you a little bit different diagram to give us a, an appreciation for it. So if we look at this body plan, we can see hip, we can see knee, we can see ankle, and we can see the foot down. And notice what happened. The proportion of what we call the thigh here stayed about the same, but everything got longer compared to the whole body size. And what we're doing with this, you might have already figured this out, is we're looking at a body plan for speed, okay? Bears are pretty fast, right? But they get lumbering. Sometimes they get out of control and then they just kind of roll over and they get up again. Dogs are fast, no doubt about it, but a dog couldn't catch a deer. Okay, and so we're seeing that these proportions are related to, in this case, speed. Okay, all right. So here's a nice Kodiak bear. This is up on Kodiak Island in Alaska. And I was on a trip up here. We wanted to go see these bears in the wild. We walked in every day and we would see these bears and they were just magnificent. These are the largest bears uh, on the planet. And we would be in a little area, it'd be about eight or nine of us. And I kept looking around thinking, okay, how fast is that bear to me? It could easily catch me. But how fast am I to the rest of the people in my group? But I think I could outrun all of them, but maybe a couple of them. So if the bear started running at us, I thought I, I might have a chance against this. So look at a big animal, that plantigrade, 
putting all of its forepaw and rear paws on the ground to get good traction and to be able to support that way. Okay. All right. But there's another thing that these organisms do. And now I'm going to get into what we call a type of being a terrestrial animal, but being fast. Okay. And these are the sprinters. And we'll see what the other adaptation was. We saw one by just making the limb longer. But the other thing that we can do is we can make the end of this limb become very simplified. And the animals did this through evolution in sometimes just by fusing bones together so that they don't have two or three. Let's get that down to one. Maybe losing some of their toes. And in this case, we can see that these are counted. So way back in evolution, this organism did have five toes, but they lost the first and the second and the fifth. They're making this much more simple. And this organism here is an ostrich. And an ostrich is a very fast animal. So it's making this body plan kind of simplified, get rid of some bones. This is a cheetah. And a cheetah similarly has lost some of its toes. Actually, this got cut off a little bit. It does have a fifth toe. So it has two, three, four, and five, but it's making that limb smaller. And we'll see what the advantage of that. And then we have a horse. And this horse actually runs on the end of its third finger. It lost the first, the second, the fourth, the fifth fingers. And now it runs around. Could you imagine running around on the ground just on one finger and on that toenail? That's how horses look. And when we go back in the fossil record, we see horses with five digits. So they've evolved this to get rid of these limbs. You can kind of see remnants back up in here, but that's about it. Why? Speed. All right, these animals want to get fast. And by doing that, they can get away from predators. It's just a way of survival. Okay? All right. One of my favorite animals, I saw these in Africa. They are just magnificent animals. They are just the most beautiful animal you can imagine. And they are great hunters because they have the greatest speed. And look at this body plan. Look at this vertebral column arching when it's in full extension. Look at how these four limbs are reaching out to the ground how the hind limbs have pushed off with tremendous force. But I'm gonna show you a skeleton that shows you what this animal looks like when it's ready to hit the ground and push off. And I remember my professor when I was an undergrad describing how the cheetah ran and he said, and I, at first I thought he was joking and then I thought about it. But he said, if you cut the limbs off of a cheetah, which would be kind of gruesome, but if you cut the limbs off, and the cheetah just used its vertebral column to arch and move, kind of like moving like some worms do. He said that cheetah could still move at 10 miles per hour. That's fast, okay? So how do we take this body plan that we know and gain speed from it? Well, we do that by kind of altering what the bones look like and the length of the bones and so on. And so now we can see here's this vertebral column that can curve during running. Here's the scapula or the shoulder that can move. Then the arm moves, then the forearm moves, then the wrist joint, and then the boots. And what I just did is a key component to understanding velocity of any organism. And that is what we call the summation of bones. All 
right? And Mr. Webb knows this well because he hits a golf ball a lot further than I do. But this is looking at the velocities of every joint. The vertebral column moves, the shoulder moves, the arm moves, the forearm moves, the wrist moves, and finally the fingers move. Okay? But the other thing that goes along with this is all these things at the end became smaller, not in length, but in kind of mass. And all of the muscles are close to the body. And then we just send tendons down to keep everything very light. Okay? And you could do this. If you got a, a little small sledgehammer, and you grabbed it by the handle and you tried to swing that with a heavy metal head at the end. Try to swing that very fast. That's hard to do. But if you flip it around and you hold the metal head and you have the handle going out, you can just take that back and forth very quickly. And that's what these animals have done. Now you can go out and you can do an experiment very easily. Go get a baseball or tennis ball or something like that. And I want you to, I'm going to do this sideways. I want you to just stand still and don't move anything, but your hand and your wrist up here and see how far you can throw it. I think you already know the answer, don't you? You can't really throw it that far. But if you look at a baseball pitcher, what this pitcher does is the lower body moves. Watch my trunk. My trunk's now coming forward. Now my arm is rotating. Then my wrist and then my fingers, okay? And some professional baseball players can throw a baseball 100 miles per hour. And that means by the time they let go of this ball, their fingers are moving at 100 miles per hour, okay? That's velocity. And how did they do that? Summation of joints. They just simply added up all the joints, okay? So when we look at a cheetah, I love this skeleton. This cheetah is in position. Look at its hind paws here. They're ahead of the forepaws, and they're gonna grab that ground. They're gonna pull on it, and then this vertebral column, which is arched, there's kind of arched this way, is gonna curve in the other direction after it comes through. They're gonna pull out pull this body along, and then the forelimbs are going to come out and grab the ground and then pull back. And you add up all of these, and there's no animal on the planet that can run faster than this. And how did they do it? They just evolved all of these changes. Make the limbs light, keep the muscles close to the body, have a very flexible vertebral column, and you have the recipe for an amazing sprinter. Okay? Now, I don't know if you watch Olympics or track or that. Does anybody know who this fellow is? Do we have any guesses? I have a hand. You say Bolt. That's Usain Bolt, all right? They called him the world's fastest human. But I want you to look at his body plan. Look at where the muscles are. Look at these muscles, the thighs hamstrings, quadriceps, close to the body. His gluteal muscles are well developed. Look at these little skinny legs down here, okay? His body plan is for a sprinter. Doesn't matter if he's a quadruped or a biped. That is the body plan, okay? So if you wanna become really fast running, just remember you have to use all the parts of your leg. Or if you wanna throw a ball really far or really hard, you just summarize all of those joints, okay? All right. So there's a different way to get around on the ground. And that is to kind of use the lower limbs a little bit differently. So this animal here we say is ricochet. And it comes from the word ricochet, to bounce off, okay? So in a ricochet little animal, what they do is they hit the ground and then they just propel themselves into the air. They hop, 
okay? But the body plan is pretty much the same in that they keep their muscles very close to their body, but they change the length of the bones so that they can get this tremendous velocity to push off. And, if, and this happens to be, does anybody want to take a guess? What kind of an animal is this? I think it's a what is that? I think it's a velociraptor. No, it's not primitive. This is living on the planet right now. Kangaroo. That's a kangaroo. Okay. And look at its its hind limbs are very, very long. It has four limbs, little short arms. Pick up and eat seeds and stuff like that. Okay. When they move around, they don't run, they hop. So their hind limbs work in concert with each other, okay? But it's the same principle of this velocity of moving their body in a very fast uh, motion. And they keep these parts, the distal part, the ends of the limbs very light. This is where all the tendons come in, but the muscles are close to this part of the body, okay? Can we do that? Some people do. We actually have an event in the Olympics a long jump. And humans think, I can jump as far as it can be. No, not quite. All right. This is a little bit differently. So when I say live on the ground, well, how about live underground? And why would they do this? How to get away, away from predators. Because it might be a good safe place. So these animals dig into the ground and they create burrows. Right? And we say these are fossoria, meaning they're underground. And so what they did is they modified their limbs so that they can move dirt out of the way. They're incredible burrow, burrowers. You could not believe how fast they can dig a hole. Unbelievably fast. But look at their hand. Their hand looks like a shovel. And these are bones. These are the wrist bones, and these are the fingers for the digits. And they put sharp claws on it, and they just dig through that dirt, and then they push it out of the way, just like a shovel can do. And the bones, even though they're relatively small, this isn't a very large animal, the bones here are really beefy. I mean, look how thick these bones are compared to the hind one. These are just spindly bones in the hind one. Okay. And this is a gopher. And this is the way to survive that gophers do. So if we look at this image of the forelimb, we can see the shoulder blade up here, but here's the arm and look at this forearm. This is beefy and it's thick. It's not slender and light. They're not doing this for running on the ground to get away from predators. They're digging down into the ground. Look at these big fingernails, these claws to pull out. But they take advantage of something else. They take advantage of a leverage system. And this bony landmark right here is this bone on you. So when you move your forearm like this, you have a muscle called the triceps that pulls our forearm in this direction. It extends it. But ours is very short, okay? But if you look at a gopher, actually, this is a different animal that I'm not going to give you the name of because I'm going to show you a skeleton of it. It has this really long bony landmark. I'm going to give you an anatomical term. I'll see if you can remember. And that is the electrum. And so this animal has this really big muscle with its tendon attaching to it. And it just extends and digs all day long. That's what it does. And it's simply designed, it's adapted for that. So they go underground. And because of that, they're able to survive. They can get away from predators. They can get away from hot environments. They can go underground in the desert and get to a place that's cool and only come out at night. All right. So it's a way of surviving. All right. So we're going to move to a new environment, different environment. 
not on the land, but up in trees, okay? So animals that live in an environment where there are trees getting up off the ground is a good way to get away from predators. And this is a little bit dark, but if you can kind of look at these hairs right here, these are coming off of the ears. This is the marmoset. And marmosets and trees are unbelievably agile animals. And if you watch them in the trees, they almost look like they're on the ground. They run around on branches, they jump from limb to limb. They are amazing at getting away from predators. And they can get from one tree to another, maybe because another tree has more fruit or something on it, and they live in trees. That's their whole life, okay? But the body plan doesn't change in a sense that if I showed you the fore limbs and the hind limbs, they would be really similar to say a dog, okay? But the, the one thing that does set them apart is with their fingers and their toes because they're able to wrap around branches and it might be hard to see this, but they are grasping on the branch here, okay? And that's how they can stay in, in place. Or if they jump from one branch to another, grab that branch and hold on, okay? But some animals, let me give you the word for this. Some animals that are arboreal, meaning living in trees, think of Arbor Day, some animals take a little bit different path. And they move in a much different way. They swing from branch to branch and they just move out to the next branch and the next one. And we say these are brachiated. And brachium means farm. So they are using their upper limb to swing from one branch to the other. If you, if you ever go to a zoo, Oakland Zoo has these animals. These, uh, this is a gibbon. And they are amazing to watch because they go from tree to branch to tree. And I mean, they're so fast you can't even see them. They're that graceful and that mobile in there. So if something's trying to get them in the tree, no chance, okay? Because they can move so quickly like this. So what's the difference between a tree that's, or uh, excuse me, an animal that's arboreal like this, this is a sloth. And another animal that's arboreal, but we say that it is a brachial bird. Well, the gibbons just have really long limbs. And that gives them the advantage that they start on one branch. I'm going to start over here. If I start on one branch, and if I go like this, look how far I can go with my wingspan. And that's what these organisms have evolved to. Do. And that's how they get around. Okay. And they're very good at it. Sloths. They live their whole life in trees. They just slowly climb up, slowly climb up. But you'll learn with sloths, sometimes they forget what they're doing. Sometimes their vision isn't real good. And they reach for a branch and whoops, didn't quite make it. All the way down through the branches, they hit the ground. Sometimes they just get dazed and they start climbing back up. But they live in trees for the most part. These animals are. They're just amazing, the uh, gibbons when we see these. Look at that, the upper limb all the way to the ground. Are we arboreal? Well, sometimes we think we are. We move around like this, okay? Next group. These are flying animals, or what we call uh, aerialist or aviator animals. Same body plan. You haven't changed it. Hind limb. They use their limbs to grab things. They can walk on the ground, but they've modified the upper limb so that, in this case, this is an eagle, that to have a wing to fly, what they do is they just attach the feather. To the wing or to their upper limb, and that creates the wing that they fly with. 
Do they still use their muscles in that the same way? Absolutely. We still have an arm, we still have a forearm, and we have the, in this case, because of the forearm, these are metacarpals. And the metacarpals have extended and there really aren't many digits in them. Fingers. And this out here is a feather. So we're only seeing a wing that's about this long, okay? And we can see this body plan in this image. And when we look at this, we can see that, well, there is a finger here. That would be our equivalent of our thumb. Two is extended and then three is a nubby and four and five are back. And we just attach feathers throughout this entire edge, okay? Ring the limbs out flap them the ability to fly. Okay. What about this organism? Does anybody want to take a guess at that? What is this? Uh, is that a bat? Pardon? Is that a bat? That is a bat, okay? And bats fly. Bats are very good at flying but they've evolved a different way to fly. So if you remember in the birds, we're using the edge of this upper limb to attach the feathers to this. Look at what the bats are doing. This is the middle finger of the bat, okay? And these are, these bones are the elongated bones of its third finger. Okay, the forearm, fairly long, arm, relatively long, but what do they do? They attach a membrane from finger to finger to the forearm. And this creates their wing. And they can just flap basically the same way that other birds do. They don't have feathers, it's a skin, a membrane of skin, very, very thin, so thin that you can see the blood vessels within it. And that's their body plan, okay? And look at their hind legs. Just to hold on to a crevice, a rock, a branch, or something like that when they hang upside down and sleep. And when they get on the ground, which they do sometimes, they have to push with their wings and move their hind legs in front, and then they just kind of crawl along. They're not very good on the ground. But they are good in the air, okay? And so we can see this body plan. The humans try to fly. Sometimes they do crazy things. I'm not sure I'd do that. Just throw myself up in the air and then hope that I hit on the skis when I get down there. That might be pretty tough. All right. One last one. And that's aquatic. Animals that live in the water, right? But it's still the same body plan. This is a drawing of a porpoise and a human swimmer. We like to think we're pretty good at swimming. And this is basically what a porpoise looks like. Everything is four legged. Same plan though, shoulder, very short arm forearm, wrist bones, and then the bones out to the digits or the fingers. And when we look at this, we can see similar body planes with organisms that live in the water. We can see arms, we can see forearms. It's the same pattern, no matter what we look at. But if we look at this, we see that this is a sea turtle. Okay. This is a penguin, so that's not even a mammal. This is a penguin, which is a bird. This is a seal. And this is a dolphin. Same body plan. Just modify them to the way that they move, okay? Sea turtles, very graceful, moving their forelimbs to swim. Penguins very quick. They can dart around in the water. They're very, very agile. 
sea lions or seals, very powerful swimmers. And dolphins, we know, are very fast, but they have a tail fin that helps with propulsion too. Okay? So that's what I've shown you, is that all these animals have the same plan. It hasn't really changed. We just modify them to the environment, okay? So I'm going to exit. There's a nice sprinter. And I'm gonna start bringing in some skeletons. And you can ask questions about the lecture. And then I'm gonna see if you can apply what you've learned and you can tell me what you think your answers are for the skeletons that I'm going to show you, okay? So I have to turn my com computer and my camera around. So give me a second and then we'll get started with this. All right, ready? I'm gonna do this randomly. Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here. One, what is this animal adapted for? What is it good at doing? All right, let's see who has their hand up. Um, Olivia, did you have your hand up from for this or for earlier? Um, for earlier. Did you want to take a guess because we didn't get a chance to call on you earlier? Um, I'm okay. All right, Miss Maddox, you see anyone else? Looks like Elliot has their hand up. Uh, yeah, is it adapted for running? It is adapted for running. And if you look at how the toes hit the ground, does anybody remember what that name is? Terrestrial animals that move on the, the ends of all their toes, or all the toes together. What did we call that? Ms. Maddox, you see any hands up? Oh, uh, Malia uh, chatted uh, a digit, digitigrade? Digitigrade, very good. This is a cat. It's an animal that's good at running. That's a great guess, fantastic. All right, let me get another one. Malia, I was gonna ask Ms. Maddox, so you just, you just saved her. All right, here we go. There's one key bony landmark that gives this one away. What is this animal adapted for? Looking for hands. That's the key. I see Calvin's hand up. Calvin? Okay, Calvin, are you there? Um, I see the shell right there. So I'm, and also it looks like an armadillo. So I'm guessing it probably adapted for like armor protection and stuff. So this is for protection, but how about in what kind of an environment does it live in? I forget. Can you just tell me, you don't have to say the name of it, but what, where do you think it lives? And you may not know unless you've driven across Texas, <laughs> where they have millions of armadillos. On the side of the road. is up above. Yeah, on the side of the road, dead. Yes? Is it adapted Go. for climbing? Sorry, I heard two things at once. Um, Elliot asked if it's adapted for climbing. No, that's the key right there. Abby, go for it. I thought you, you just told me that it was supposed to. I can barely hear you. And if you need to, uh, students, you can put a guess in the chat. Uh, I just have chat turned on to me. So if you have a guess and your mic's not working, feel free to. Uh, I've got a T-Rex. Yeah. 
I've got two people who guessed in the right? chat. Penelope and Sarah said digging. You got it. Armadillos live in burrows, okay? And this is that electronom process. So they're very powerful diggers. And look at their claws, just digging and clawing through the ground. All right, let's get another one. So students, this is what a classroom looks like when you get to college. And St. Mary's is a very uh, prestigious university. It's not too far away from here. It's in Moraga, which is, uh, Professor, what's the closest big city, like Concord or? Kind of Creek or Concord, yep. Yeah. All right. How does this animal get around? <laughs> What do you think this animal is? All right, so Lucas guessed chicken. Right. Um, Cassidy guessed for flying, and Brooke guessed for flying. Rowan guessed running. Pterodactyl. Andre's guessing pterodactyl. Not a pterodactyl. Uh, Gwendolyn guessed that it's a flamingo. Maybe no. No, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. It peacock. looks like a peacock. Ava guessed peacock as well. Okay. But when it, you, it, looks but, like, it looks like it kind of smells and like it could have those wings, you know? Hmm. Okay. Ostrich. Ostrich. All right. um, Alex guessed, I'm trying to keep track of the chat. There's a lot of guesses coming in. I have guesses for swan, peacock, crane, uh, a moa. Ostrich. I guessed a moa as well on my end and people are saying flying, walking, flying, yeah. running, moa. All right. Very simple. Chicken, which can fly, believe it or not, some can fly, and running around. So they're bipedal, but they're also aviators. Okay. All right. Let's see how good we are. That was a chicken? It's a big chicken. Chickens are bigger than that. All right. So, Andre, make sure you're not interrupting. Thank you. All right. These structures go on the ends of the toe right there. These two go on the ends of the toe. Do you remember what that design was called? Uh, is it Sedil and Smithful Warning, but I forgot the name. Hmm. So a guess for deer. Did anybody write down that term? I know a couple of you were taking notes. Aiden guessed deer leg, Gwendolyn guessed deer. What is that term though? Anybody remember? Oh, um, I from Malia again, on Gula grade. On Gula grade, that's correct. This looks like a deer, but this is what's nice about looking at a body plan. This is a goat. So its limb looks very similar to deer. Okay. All right, good. Give you a couple more. I'm glad someone was taking notes. That's awesome. I'll have to look up what that prefix means, angula grade. Angula. I wonder what that means. Angular? What's un like? Oh, what's this? Is that a baby? <laughs> That's an adult. All right, who, Miss Maddie, she gotta, we gotta get Andre to, can we just perma-mute Andre? Is that an option? All right, I'm getting no. this for um, monkey, chimpanzee, monkey. orbital. All right, so students, that's not respectful at all. We need to stop that. And if we have to talk after class, we will. Okay. Um, Ape, monkey, monkey, chimpanzee. Okay, same family as chimpanzee. Monkey. Okay, this is in the, the primate family. Hmm. But look at its limbs on the ground like this. This is plantigrade oh. locomotion. This is a terrestrial animal, lives on the ground all of the time. Could go up in trees occasionally, but definitely designed for being on the ground, terrestrial. 
I have a guess, a baboon or a gorilla? Uh, this is much too small. Yeah. It would be nice to have a gorilla skeleton, but I'm not sure where I would keep it. Okay. What was it? Did we hear what it was? Did I miss it? It's a, it was a small chimpanzee. Okay, so we had that one. Okay. All right, one? I think we have time for one more. Good. This will be unique. Ooh. I didn't talk about this animal, but can you tell me what this animal is good at? Frog. 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 Monkey. Woo! Jumping. Yeah, look at Frog. the limbs. Look how long they are. And that's how frogs get away from predators, is they just Frog. they just jump as far as they possibly can. Okay? But same body plane. Thigh, leg, ankle, and then toes. Okay? It kind of looks like a fish, but like with What was that? I, I think on it kind of looks like a fish. Kind of looks like a fish. Oh, the head kind of shaped like a fish head. And the yep. bones, the rib cage. Yeah. All right. So go out and look at animals and see how they're designed and then think about what are they good at. When I was in college, the prof asked me one thing What is this animal adapted for? How is its body plan matched to its environment? Okay. And if you, as we just kind of wrap up, if you see this skeleton back here, and you look at our limbs, you can think about this after class. What are we adapted for? Okay. So Mr. Uh, Luke, he can get the questions to me and I'll, I'll answer those for you. Okay. Well, it's 10 o'clock. That was perfect timing. Um, I sat here the whole time and I was completely locked in. I learned a lot of vocabulary um, and I will post this video in the classroom if in case you wanna watch it again. Um, I got a lot of uh, chats, how they wanna they want to see some certain parts again. And uh, I just wanna thank you, Professor Smith. Um, hopefully I'll see you soon for golf. And um, let's give Professor Smith a round of applause. Maybe when you make it to college, you can um, join his class. And uh, this went really well. Um, so real quick before we go, uh, Miss Maddox has some ACE work on their Google Classroom and I don't have anything for today. Um, so don't worry about that for my class. Um, we'll get back to it on Friday. But well, let's give Professor Smith a round of applause. Thank you for joining us. Thank you students for um, your awesome answers, taking notes. And hopefully we can do this again soon. I know Professor Smith, you have one about teeth that we talked about yesterday that sounds really cool. Um, yeah. And then on Friday, my class will talk about how does this connect to what we're studying. And the last thing I'll say is that I know in eighth grade, um, a lot of these same topics come up. So kind of keep that in mind um, two years from now. But I'm going to let you all go because you only have a 15 minute break. Miss Maddox, did you have anything you want to say real quick? Are you good? I can't no. find a secret it's working. So much, Professor Smith. That was awesome. You're welcome. It's nice talking with everybody. All right, well, I'm going to hang out here for a minute. I'm going to stop my recording.